Can I Trust the Bible? Coming to you from the land of the Bible. Welcome to the Can I Trust the Bible live stream. I'm Raj Nair here in San Diego, joined by the one and only Yair Pinto, live from Jerusalem, my brother, Achi. How are you, my friend? First of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on this podcast. It's an honor. And I wish you could have been here in Jerusalem with me so we can do some, you know, talking face to face and not in front of a screen. Exactly. It's been a while since I've been over there. I need to get back there. So on this, uh, let's call it a podcast. Let's call it a live stream. Uh, this is live. If you don't want, you don't believe me, if you can watch, my phone says it's 9.01 Pacific time. So this is this is a live stream. So if you're watching this live, we want to give you the latest breaking news coming out of the Middle East. Uh, but if you're not watching this live and it's, you know, a few months from now, we want to also equip you with, you know, why should Christians care about Israel? What can Christians be doing um, in prayer, in support, you know, giving people some context. So this is going to be an ongoing conversation. This isn't a one-time thing. Uh, but yeah, here for our friends who are actually watching us live, can you give us um, the latest of what's happening between Israel and Iran and Gaza, and just kind of make sense for us um, from a from a biblical perspective, like from a Christian perspective, how should we be viewing what's happening in the Middle East right now? Okay, that's a question that will take me maybe two hours to answer, okay. but I'll try to do it in five minutes. So in general, Israel is at war with Iran. Iran launched an unprecedented attack that included 350 uh, drones, missiles that are ballistic missiles, cruise missiles at the Jewish state. Thank God, God protected us. And we have good uh, defense systems that were able to intercept 99% of these missiles. This happened on Sunday. You know, it's weird because we are like back to business as usual, but we just were attacked with biggest amounts of rockets that ever were fired at any country from another country in the world's history, uh, you know, for one attack. So it was crazy. And, and that's only one front. On top of that, we are at war with Hamas since October 7th. So Hamas is a terrorist organization. They're Palestinians. On their charter, it states that they want to control all of Israel and destroy basically the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And they actually did what they say. And they launched an attack against the Israeli communities surrounding the Gaza Strip on October 7th and uh, kidnapped uh, 240 Israelis, that's including women, children, the elderly, babies. And we still have 133 of these civilians, including one small baby inside the Gaza Strip that are still being held, kidnapped for half a year. Mm. Okay, So this is a, a terrorist group that we're fighting in the Gaza Strip, we launched, of course, an offensive against Gaza in order to retrieve our hostages, in order to destroy this terrorist group. Okay, that's the second front. We have a third front in the northern border with uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that is sponsored by who? Iran. Okay, Iran sponsored Hezbollah. Iran sponsors uh, Hamas. So. And their goal is also to attack Israel. Basically, if we upset Iran, then they send Hezbollah to launch missiles at us. And they are the terrorist group that controls Lebanon. Mm. Okay, so they are attacking us every day since the 7th of October as well. I was there two days ago filming a series for, for our YouTube channel at uh, TBN Israel. We do daily updates. And we were filming. And as we were filming... Um, two drones and five uh, missiles were launched above our head. We were like taking the shelter and then we saw the explosion. Of course, you know, we are we're journalists. We, we drove there and uh, went to check it out. Not so smart. And my wife wasn't very happy about that. But uh, it's real. The mm. whole northern part of Israel is basically filled with ghost towns. Wow. 65,000 Israelis are displaced and are now um, in hotels and in refugee camps kind of in Israel. Okay, yeah, so that's yeah. the situation. And this is not the last front. Yeah. Let me just we, finish we with all on. the fronts and then we can chit chat and I will not talk so long. <laughs> but the, the, another front is the Houthis. Houthis is Yemen. What do they have to do with Israel? 
I don't know why do the Yemen uh, care about Israel so far away, but they do. They want to destroy us as well. They launch ballistic missiles. They attack ships. They disrupt all the shipping routes of the world, basically causing you and me to pay more for anything we buy from the East. So that's the, so that's the situation uh, here with that. And we have Palestinian terrorists in the West Bank. That means Judea and Samaria that also wants to conduct operations against Israel. I'm done. That's the, that's the situation in a few words. You broke that down beautifully, Yair. And I think the question that a lot of um, Western Christians are wondering, um, what's going on? Well, you, you just named five different things, you know, Hezbollah, the Houthis, you know, uh, certain terrorist organizations, Iran. I have a, obviously a, an opinion about why this is happening, but as an Israeli, why do you think there is so much um, against you guys? Why, why do you think the entire Middle East in a lot of ways, you know, that, that is changing obviously with Abraham Accords and, you know, Saudi Arabia and Jordan helping, you know, shoot some of these projectiles down. But what do you think is happening from a, I guess, maybe a spiritual perspective? What, 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 why is there such enmity to Israel and the Jewish people? I guess, conversely, uh, and the same token, why should Christians in America or Canada or the UK, why should we care? I, I obviously could go on for a long time, but I want to hear from you. Why should Christians in the West or anywhere really care about what's happening to the Jewish people? Well, that's a good question, okay? And I've been thinking and asking myself and praying to God, why? Why should Christian care about Israel and the Jewish people? And the answer to that is actually, they shouldn't care about us because we are not special. The people of Israel have nothing special. They're not better. They're not uh, holier. We are sinners. We... Uh, the majority of Israel don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in Yeshua. But I'll tell you why people in the world should care about Israel. Because God promised to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people, that he will protect them and he will be with them. He gave them a covenant to be here in the Jewish state. Here in Jerusalem, you see behind me, that's exactly where the first and second temples once stood. And God's covenant is forever. He had Amen. that covenant with Abram. And the reason Christians around the world should support Israel and should even look toward, towards Israel and see what's going on is because if they need encouragement to their mm. own lives, they can take a look at Israel and say, wow, God is faithful to these people that, that most of them don't believe in him, but he's faithful. So imagine how faithful he will be to me in my day-to-day -day wow. life, in whatever I'm suffering through. So it's, that's, the, I think, the majority in what I understood. It's not about the people of Israel. It's about God. And mm -hmm. God picked Israel as an example for the world. That's why you read the Bible, you see Israel. You look at Israel now, you see God's faithfulness now. So he was faithful in the Bible. He's faithful now. He will be faithful to you in Alaska, to you in America, to you in India, and uh, the rest of the world. So that's why we are here. <laughs> you, ju you just uh, nailed the thesis, one of the main pillars behind why we started this channel. You know, whenever I have, um, I, not the word doubt, but, but just questions, I look at Israel. You, statistically, and if you look at it from a probability standpoint, the Jewish peoples should have ceased to exist a long time ago. But when the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob makes a promise, makes a covenant, he keeps it. And so when I walk around Israel, yes, it's spiritual. Yes, you get to see where Yeshua walked. And yes, it's, but we are, we see on Google Earth, on, on our maps, a trophy, a certificate to the God of Israel, that he keeps his promises. And to me, that is the most um, reassuring thing I think you can possibly imagine. But here, here's, the, here's the question. And I think you actually, you know, you did a, a fantastic job of, of explaining it. It's not for your namesake, O Israel, that I'm about to do these things. So there is a, a growing movement 
as I'm sure you're aware, in the West, specifically evangelical Christians, where there's starting to be a slight turning away from Israel. And I, I want to uh, ask you this question, as someone who's in the IDF, as someone who's you know fought in wars, what would you say, I, and I know this is a little inflammatory, but this is what I what you hear when you're on social media, when you hear the, the, the accusation that Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza, when Israel is doing these horrible things to the Palestinians, and then you have these Americans, they're trying to marry that with, but the Bible says to support Israel. Help me out, Yair. How how can both things be true? What what what's going on? So basically, of course, there's a war and civilians get hurt. And as as Christians, as uh, believers in Yeshua, all of us need to need to try to find a solution and end for that. But as I've been saying, that the reason that Christians around the world should look through Israel, and the reason for that is God. There's also the flip side to that. And the enemy also has his eyes set against Israel. And because he knows that God uses Israel as an example to his faithfulness to the whole world, he wants to destroy Israel. Because if he destroys Israel, he basically destroys God's covenant to the Jewish people, and to the world, and to Israel, and to each and everybody who believes in God. So that is exactly why all the world and all these enemies are attacking Israel. I mean, there is no logical reason. Why would they care? It's like Iran has enough problems. They don't have, uh, their currency is super low. It's like 40000 to $1. And uh, they don't have employment. They have sanctions. There is poverty all over the Middle East, and they invest millions and millions of dollars in order to equip our enemies with missiles and the technologies for war. And also, all these terrorist states and organizations use their civilians as human shields in order to show that Israel are the bad guys. So this, I've been saying it a lot, like on my on my, I don't know, updates and YouTube and stuff like that. This war is fought on multiple fronts. So one front is the physical front. Second one is the front for the media, for the mm -hmm. truth, because uh, we are losing their like big time. The enemy has a well-oiled propaganda machine of, you know, distorting the truth and the information that is coming out. And then the third front, which is the biggest one, is the spiritual war. And you need to understand why are we being attacked? It's not because we're oppressing the Palestinians or something like that. We are the only democratic state country in the Middle East, okay? We have Arab parliament members. We have Jewish parliament members. We have Christian parliament members. We have freedom of religion in this country. So in terms of um, Christians in America, we are given all these minorities basically the best life they can have in the Middle East. And still, everybody wants to kill us and say we are bad, and that's a spiritual war, and that's a war of deception. Okay, I don't know if I answered the question, but I, no, that, I hope that, I did. That was perfect. And I think it's really interesting uh, talking to an Israeli follower of, of Yeshua. Uh, we have a lot of mutual friends that are Israeli followers of Yeshua. Uh, Kalev Myers, Michael Mastretta from Firm, a lot of, uh, a lot of good friends. Um, yeah. So I guess the the, the since I have you as someone who's fought in this war specifically, what can you tell me? And and I, I think there there's a distinction. This isn't uh just um this isn't just military. This is there's something spiritual happening as as you've mentioned. What what does the IDF do in order to minimize civilian casualties? Because you see these statistics, it's alarming, it's terrifying, it's horrific. You see the images. Well, you you said that there is a massive propaganda machine um, trying to make the Jewish state look bad. So as someone who has fought in this war for the Israeli yeah. Defense Forces, what's the reality that you see on the ground when it comes to civilian casualties? Okay, so let me tell you what the IDF is doing before it conducts an operation in a civilian area. And when I say civilian area, all of the Gaza Strip is a civilian area that is being held captive by Hamas, a terrorist group. Okay, so before we enter, the first thing we do is 
fly planes with leaflets, meaning papers that have notes saying to the civilian population, get out of this neighborhood. The IDF is about to attack it because terrorists are hid, hiding there and preparing to attack us. Okay, that doesn't sound like somebody that an army that is at war is doing. Okay, so because if the civilians can read, then the terrorists can read as well. So it's kind of counterproductive when you think about it as a army who's attacking and wants to destroy the enemy. So that's one thing we do. The second thing is that we call the people by phone. Okay, we have Israeli officers that speak Arabic. Okay, some of them are Israeli Arabs, speak of, uh, Arabic, and they call. If we are about to strike a specific building, we call the people by phone, one by one, telling them we are about to attack in an hour, in two hours, get out. Okay, so that's, again, very counterproductive. Then, in previous wars, we also used to send a little, uh, like a mini bomb on the roof. It's called knock on, knock on, the, on the roofs to let them know to, to evacuate the, the house, okay? So this is what we do. And of course, we do not attack um, like hospitals, schools, um, UN buildings. It's very hard to attack these places. Also, it's part of the international law of war and we abide by the international law, okay? So of course, Hamas knows that and they go and hide in these places and they forbid the, the Palestinians from leaving these places and basically keep them as hostages. So when we attack, there are more casualties and they can film it, send it, make us uh, look bad. And I'll tell you personally, okay, the first day we entered the Gaza, Khan Yunis, which is in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, this wall. Okay, so we did all this process, but we did not attack the school. In, in a neighborhood from the air because they, we didn't get their permission because it's not allowed according to international law. So we send grounds, uh, troops, ground troops to the area. And what, what happened? Terrorists started open fire from the school, from underground terror tunnels and killed and wounded our troops. And when I say our troops, it's people that have jobs and they got recruited to the IDF. They have families. That's not their profession on a day-to-day -day basis. And they lost their lives, risked their lives. And only after we had casualties and all the permissions, then we could strike down that building. So yeah. that's, we are risking our own soldiers' lives in order to protect the Palestinian civilians. And I have another story before this war. When I was a soldier, I was 19. That was like... A, well, 15 years ago, something like that. I was in uh, Rafiach, in Rafah. They, they fired mortars at my tank. I saw the guy that was on a microphone and on a radio telling the mortars where to shoot, and I didn't have permission to shoot at him. I had him in my scope of the tank, and I did not have permission to shoot at him because they were afraid that I will harm a civilian area that was behind him. So this is how much. And he was shooting at my tank mortars. Wow. So we are literally risking our lives in order to protect the Gazan civilians. And I think it's an important distinction to realize that, you know, if as an American, if someone were to attack Maine or Seattle or Miami, whoever attacked those places would cease to exist the next day. And the United States would be, all things considered, fine. Israel the size of New Jersey, can't afford to lose one war one time. It's exactly. so tiny that if, you know, there's 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 a part of the West Bank that goes from the West Bank to uh, the Mediterranean Sea that I think is like eight or nine miles wide at one point. We're talking about a very small country. So I want to ask you this. This is, I want to I wanna switch to uh, a little bit more encouraging what can Christians do at home. But, but yeah, first yeah. I want to ask you this question. As an, an Israeli follower of Yeshua, how have you seen the hand of God, the presence of God, um, shelter the Jewish people, shelter, uh, protect? How have you seen the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob actively uh, at work in these prophetic times? I'll give you a fresh example. On Sunday 
in the middle of the night when Iran launched, I don't know, 350,000 drones, uh, uh, projectiles, missiles. We were 99% accurate with our defense system. This thing doesn't work usually. You know, it's like you always have a human error. You always have a malfunction of a machine. Like statistic doesn't lie. And it just worked better than anybody except, you know, thought or even planned for it to work. And that's, that's a miracle for itself. And I'll tell you another miracle. The day after, the Israelis already are thinking, okay, can I send my kids to kindergarten now? Is it okay to get back to, to our normal life? So just not being traumatized by this is another miracle, I think, that, yeah. that is only by the grace of God. Also for me and my family, you know, I've been at war for four months and uh, we are, it takes time, but we're back to, back to business, back to work. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Jewish people. You know, I've I've been to Auschwitz, Auschwitz with an Auschwitz survivor. I've spent a lot of my life in Israel. And if there's any people on the face of the earth that could make their identity a victim, it should be the Jewish people. Yeah. But the Jewish people, they don't they they embrace their heritage. They acknowledge that there's people trying to kill them and have been trying to kill them for millennium, millennia, but they don't make their identity a victimhood. It's a forward-thinking, life-first people group. And to me, that's one of the most beautiful things about the Jewish people. So, you know, there are people watching this that obviously have never been to Israel, might not even know a Jewish person. Um, but what would you say to someone watching this that says, you know, obviously there's a biblical mandate to, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? How do I support Israel? How do... What can someone watching this practically do to help the situation uh, that's a follower of Jesus? Okay, so we were all called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I'm here sitting with the Jerusalem background, so it looks really, you know, really real. But it's very hard. It's very hard to pray for something you don't have a personal connection to. You know, it's easy to pray for your spouse, for your children, for your family, for your friends, but praying for Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? It's this like an image that we read about on Sunday school or something like that. It's too holy, too separated for me to connect personally. And that's the challenge. I would suggest to people that want to really pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is something that God told us to do. So it's important, okay, is to pick something small, okay? Mm -hmm. Pray for the IDF soldiers in the Gaza Strip. Pick maybe, okay, two hostages by name. This is something that uh, my father-in-law has been doing since this war started. Because we have 133 hostages still in the Gaza Strip. We have their pictures. Said, let's pick two hostages, read their stories, read what happened to them, and pray for them by name. That will give you a personal connection. I mean, we need to... To be personal, Jesus, when he walked with his disciples, he gave them day-to-day -day examples. He didn't say huge stuff and things that are so big. He gave them day-to-day -day examples of how to pray, of what to pray. And God is a personal God. So I would say find a person in Israel or somebody who is connected to Israel and pray for him. Pray for the government of Israel. Something small, not just for the country. And of course, if you want to stay up to date with what's going on, you can uh, you can watch watch the news and stay up to date and pray for these day-to-day -day situations. That will be my recommendation. And if you want to stay very up to date, subscribe to the TBN Israel YouTube page. You will see my brother Yair on there basically every day giving you um, perspective and content that you will not see anywhere else. Thank you so much for coming on. We're going to obviously have to have you back on. Uh, this is, we, we've just scratched the surface. You know, our mutual friend, Eric Stackelback, he ends with never hold your peace. But I'm not going to do that because he, only him, only he can do that. So I'm just going to say thank you. I'm going to say God bless. And if you're watching this, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.
Hey, I'm Raj Nair. Thank you for watching the Can I Trust the Bible YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you compelling evidence to trust in the validity of the Bible. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so you never miss an upload. And ask your questions in the comments and share the video with your friends and skeptics. Thanks for watching. See you next time.